for their betrayal extended even to our gods, to spren, stone, and wind. From the Ela Stile. There's a phrase that happens over and over again in the Stormlight Archive that I saw popping up in Way of Kings, saw it a couple times in Words Radiance, and then when I saw it in Oathbringer again and again, I started to take note. Sanderson is trying to tell me something. And that phrase is boots on stone, or boots grinding against stone, or boots scraping on stone. And it starts to give this image that boots, or men, are grinding or scraping against stone or the world of Roshar. This makes a lot more sense to us after Oathbringer knowing, oh, hey, spoiler alert for Way of Kings, Words of Radiance, Oathbringer, as well as other Cosmere books. So, if we know from Oathbringer that humans are the true Voidbringers and that they're not actually meant to be on Roshar, helps us understand that there's maybe something to this grinding or scraping of men being against the stone. So, as I was thinking or pondering on this phrase, which, by the way, Dalinar uses as a curse in Oathbringer when he finds out that Odium is going to attack Thalen, Thal Thalen City as opposed to attacking a Yaakoved. And so he uses it as a curse. So not only is it a common phrase that Brandon uses to use metaphor in his writing, it's also common in world, a known saying that Dalinar uses as a swear. So again, Brandon is telling us that in this world, there's this conflict that's happening that maybe they don't really know what's, what it is. So who is it that does know that men and stone shouldn't go together? Who is it that thinks that you shouldn't walk on stone? Um, yeah, Seth is the one that keys us into that, right? He calls all those people stonewalkers. He calls himself a stonewalker once he's truthless and has left Shinovar, right? So the Shin, for some reason, believe that men should not walk on stone. Uh, now, we don't exactly understand the reasoning of that, except for that it's a part of their religion. So they believe in what they call stone shamanism, as Seth tells us. All of the religions on Roshar tell us a little bit about the greater whole, as Brandon kind of gives us clues through different religions. So, Voronism, the worship of honor, has helped give us a lot of information about the heralds. There's those that follow the passions, which is obviously devotion to the god of passion, or as we know him, Odium. Interesting little fact that not everybody who follows the passions is actually following Odium or is on his side. Uh, I think it's kind of be an interesting clash when they figure that out. And there's also uh, those who follow the one or the long trail, as it is called. And that's one that I actually want to have a whole entire video on, so we won't spend much time on it here. But stone shamanism, what we actually know from that belief of the Shin, is not very much. We know a couple of customs of the Shin, as in they don't value their warriors. Well, if the Shin actually know that the humans are the Voidbringers, they would understand that the previous world was destroyed from war. So, in this new planet taking a new start, of course, who would they devalue? It would be those who make war, right? So, it kind of makes sense that the Shin value warriors as the bottom of society because they wouldn't want them to uh, ascend to the type of heights of destruction that happened on the previous planet. Apart from that, we really don't know much about the Shin except for that it's illegal, or not illegal, it's against their religion to walk on stone because stone is a god. The Shin actually aren't the only ones who view stone as a god in Roshar. So, Rock, when he's out drinking with his Bridgeman buddies, tells them a story about their gods. Rock tells them about the gods of the mountains, the gods of the waters, and the gods of the trees. Gods, Kaladin said, you mean Sprint. He sought out Sill, who had chosen a perch on a rafter up above, watching a couple of little insects climb on a post. These are gods, Rock said, following Kaladin's gaze. Yes, some gods, though they are more powerful than others. The Tanakai, he sought the strongest among them. He went first to gods of the trees. Next he visited gods of the waters. Last, Tanakai, desperate, visited the most powerful of gods, gods of mountains. 
Then, of course, there are the Pashendis, or the listeners, which is probably where the horn eater religion came from in the first place. And as was quoted at the beginning of this video from the Elastile, uh, that the Parshendi wrote, not humans, right? The Elastile, where they said the betrayal extended even to our gods, and the spren, stone, and wind. So we have three gods, the spren, stone, and wind, or we have the trees, and the waters, and the mountains. Uh, it's kind of easy to start to align these to a couple of the most powerful spren that we know of that are called shadow gods in Roshar. The wind or the waters, right, could be the storm father. We have the stone or the mountains, which we don't really know much very about. And then we have the spren. So we have three gods. We know that we have these three siblings or three higher gods. We know we only have three bondsmiths that can bond with them. Again, is this coincidence? I don't think so. There can ever be only three, one for each of us. Oathbringer told us that the Stormfather and the Night Watcher were both these shadow gods. And the Alba confirmed that these are what you can make bondsmiths with. But the third sibling, we still have a lot of mystery. While we don't know much about this third sibling, this is where I think that boots grinding against stone comes in, or all these mention of mountains, or all these mention of rock. I think that the third sibling is the god of stone or as we know them, Eurythiru. Good night, dear Eurythiru. Good night, sweet sibling. Good night, Radiance. That quote is from the gemstones that the Knights Radiance are starting to record when they're leaving Eurythiru. And we hear one of the Knights Radiance say, Good night, Eurythiru, treating it as if it was a person, and saying, Good night, sweet sibling. It's one of the only other times we use the word siblings, and those, it's almost like Brand Brandon Sanderson refers two siblings specifically for those three shadow gods. So are they repeating Eurythiru and Sweet Sibling as the same person, or are they talking about three different people? Not so sure, but it is very interesting to note that they're treating Eurythiru as if they were a person. If we go back to stone shamanism, there is one place that the Shin are allowed to walk on stone, and that place is Eurythiru, because they say it is a sacred spot. Could it be because that's where the Spren allowed them to? Eurythiru holds all these amazing technologies and mysteries, and yet, when Yasna visits it, this is what she says. All this time, we've been assuming that we lost great technology in the desolations. But it seems we are far, far more advanced than the ancients ever were. It is the process of bonding spren that we lost. So if your theory was to follow this pattern, all its great technologies, all its great mysteries, would actually come from a bond with a spren? Navani discovers that your theory is just this one large working fabric. The records below, Navani said, speak of this tower like a living thing, with a heart of emerald and ruby, and now these veins of garnet. If this tower was alive, Dalinar said, then it's dead now. Or sleeping. Sleeping or slumbering is exactly how the Stormfather describes the current state of the third sibling. The Night Watcher is like you. Are there others, though? Spren like you? Or the Night Watcher? Spren that are shadows of gods? There is a third sibling. They are not with us. In hiding? No. Slumbering. Tell me more. No. But no. Leave them alone. You hurt them enough. So from the Stormfather, we learn that the third sibling is sleeping and that mankind has hurt them some now, somehow, as if there's some type of friction there. The only other reference we get in the Stormlight Archive to a spren sleeping is actually from Silfrena, when she tells us that she was bonded previously to another knight, and then when he died, the break of that bond caused her to have this type of eternal sleep until the Stormfather found her and woke her from it, which is how she ended up missing the recreants and not being destroyed when many others were. But that break of bond caused her to sleep. Could a similar thing have happened to the third sibling? We know that the Stormfather survived his bond breaking, but what if the third sibling didn't fare the same way? What if the bond that was broken from the third sibling was a little stronger or had lasted much longer than the bond that the Stormfather had had with whoever he'd had his with? Some thought that the sibling had withdrawn from men by intent, but I find counter to that theory. Again, this is from one of those gemstones that were found in Eurythiru that were recording the history of Eurythiru as they were leaving. What's important about this quote is it comes from the first drawer. 
the Knights Radiant wanting people to understand the history of the Tower left that quote as the very, very first one for them to understand that the sibling did not withdraw by intent, but by some, something else that happened, possibly having their bond being broken. We are told that Dalinar, as a bondsmith, holds the power that Ishar held. Ishar, kind of the first herald, the one who formed the Oath Pact. Ishar, the one who also formed the Knights Radiant. In fact, Telenalot calls Shalon, when she first goes and meets him, uh, one of Ishar's knights. So it seems pretty clear that Ishar was one of the first ones to ever have a bond on Roshar. And it's probably possible that his bond was with one of these strongest gods, if he was called a binder of gods. And interesting, Rock called the mountains, or stone, the strongest of the gods. And it seems like it's that bonding or that power with him that allowed him to make the Oath Pact. So not only was Ishar the first one to ever have a bond, he was definitely the first bondsmith. So what would happen to the third sibling, or Spren, if Ishar broke that bond, after they'd probably shared, I don't know, a millennia? So is it possible that Ishar broke his bond with the sibling? If so, it would explain a little bit of this, his own craziness. All of the other heralds talk about Ishar as if he's the most wisest one that they always need to talk to. And yet we as readers, all we ever see is Ishar being this crazy priest king. Um, so... There's kind of a discord there, because all of the heralds think he's really wise, and then we see him as absolutely crazy. Could it be that his craziness has come on later because of the breaking of his bond with his friend? There are some counters to this theory, especially in the Words of Radiance epigraphs, where they're talking about who the bondsmith during the time of the Recreants was, and this was Malishi. Uh, we don't really know anything else about Malishi except for that they were part of this, um, this era. Malishi, though, has an I-S-H in it. Could this be another name for Ishar as he's coming back into the Knights under a new name? I don't know. I also think the third sibling being the god of stone would also help explain a little bit of why the wind blades around Kolinar and the Tower of Yurthiru have the same stone, the same strata that Shalon recognizes. Right? And maybe that has something to do with all of the Dawn cities and maybe even Cymatics where... Uh, Capsule uses that string instrument with the sand to make it make the shape of all the Dawn Cities. That could all be related to there being a, a spren that is over all of stone. There are others who believe that the third sibling is Kusakesh, who is that water spren near the Eerie Alley, uh, as recorded in the interlude by Axes the Collector, that seems to suck a little bit of life out of people. I don't think that Kusakesh is the third sibling simply because he doesn't seem to be asleep. Uh, but there is a reason that Sanderson's putting him in here. There's some hints he's trying to drop with Kusakesh that I'm going to talk about in other videos. Also, there's another water spren monster something that shows up in Oathbringer in an interlude where the Herdazians are capturing one of the rich, um, rich Alethi and feeding him to some type of water monster, and we see this huge claw come up. Could that be Kusakesh? Maybe... Uh, it just doesn't seem like he would be the type of spren that would ever want to bond with men. I'm sticking to the idea that Eurythiru itself is actually run on a spren bond, or that there's this some sibling that makes Eurythiru work. But whether or not Eurythiru worked with some type of bond with spren or not, we do know that the tower and the tower of Eurythiru and that the third sibling are going to play a huge part in the next book, Rhythm of War, because in the few words of synopsis that Brandon Sanderson gives us, he mentions the Tower of Eurythiru and some of the secrets behind it, as well as that is exactly what Odium asks of King Teravangian when he visits him at the very end of Oathbringer. He asks him to figure out how much they know about the Tower. Why would Odium care about what they know about the Tower unless it's going to have a big impact on their war against him? The arms race that follows will challenge the very core of the Radiance ideals, and potentially reveal the secrets of the ancient tower that was once the heart of their strength. Is it possibly the heart of their strength? Because it was run on the power of the spren of the founder Ishar of the Knights Radiant. Let me know what you think in the comments below if you have other uh, theories or discussions. As much as I love my own ideas, I love the discussion more. So please comment. If you like this video, subscribe, and I'll see you guys later.